As uh, Fotini explained, uh, I'm going to, to talk about chemical ecology and reverse chemical ecology, so a different topic from what we've heard before, um, except that probably there may be a link with the fungi, so a new area to investigate. <clears throat> so um, as Fotini explained, I have to change my slide. I'm working in, in France, in uh, INRAE. INRAE is a National Institute for Agricultural and Environmental Research. And uh, probably you know Versailles because of this wonderful palace. I don't know if you visited it already, but you should go. So this is this view is when you look at the palace and if you just turn, you see the more wonderful park and you can see that our lab is located here on the left. I don't know if you see my mouse. You see my mouse or not? Yes, we see it. Okay. So you see that our lab is located here in this wood. So uh, in fact, we are within the park of the Versailles Palace. So if you have the occasion to visit Versailles and the palace, please give, give us a visit. I would be very pleased to, uh, to have you in the lab and to have you visiting the lab. So um, the chemical senses of insects, that is mainly, that is olfaction and taste, they, they drive a very important behavior uh, via the use of what we call semiochemicals. They could be, for example, pheromones or other allelochemicals. They use that for many uh, important behavior, like finding a mate via the pheromones, find, finding good food, finding a good place for reposition, and so on. So, this chemical communication can be disturbed with synthetic semiochemicals for pest control. It's already uh, used for uh, decades, such as uh, two, those two examples, uh, the pheromone traps, where you put here a lure uh, diffusing pheromone, you put um, some glue here and you catch the insect. Another uh, classical way for using the semiochemicals is mating disruption. In this Tree uh, or char, you can see those uh, small dispenser. In fact, they diffuse the pheromone in the air and diffuse a lot of pheromone so that the males coming to find females, in fact, they are disturbed because there are pheromone everywhere and they, they, they don't know where to go. They are lost. They are disturbed. So those are classical methods, uh, but they are not um, widely used. They have limitation. And um, it's, it's then necessary to try to improve those methods or to find alternatives. So uh, in this context, the objective of our groups is not only applied, it's also um, uh, basic research in neurobiology and chemical communication. We have three main objectives. The first one is to understand how the insect is able to select the good information in a complex environment, because there is not only the pheromone, it's, it's a, or one interesting semiochemical. It in fact, it's in fact uh, within a chemical landscape and a very complex chemical landscape. So to answer this question, we are uh, understanding the peripheral mechanism of photon reception, especially focusing on chemosensory receptors. I will go and explain you that more in detail later. The second objective we have is do and how um, those receptors can shape the animal ecology and especially its sensory ecology and uh, participate in species adaptation and even speciation. So for that, we are using functional genomics, evolutionary genomics. And the last point is uh, more applied because um, we are identifying receptors that could be used as new, new target for pest control in what we call the reverse chemical ecology approach. So to define this term, uh, I first um, remind you or explain you if you are not familiar with that, what are the classical methods in chemical ecology? Classically, you try to identify uh, compounds from an insect, if you are looking for a pheromone, or from a plant. Uh, you collect uh, the volatiles, you do the analysis uh, using uh, different technologies to identify what is inside those very complex mixture. Once you have identified uh, what is inside, you ask the insect, are you able to smell this one? And for that, we use classically electrophysiology and for example, uh, electroantenography. You put electrodes on the antennae, you, um, you puff the insect with different odorants, and if there is an electrical response, it means that the insect is able to recognize the odorant. But we don't know if uh, it, 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 like, it likes or, or 
that doesn't like the compound. So we have to go to the behavior and to do uh, a, a lot of uh, tests. So for that, we need to have the insect reared in the lab in good shape, in a good physiology. So you can see that this is really a long process if you want to identify an active or repellent uh, project. So the principle of reverse chemical ecology is to start from the mechanism of the olfactory process, especially looking at the different proteins that are involved in this process, and to work at the protein level. You can work in vitro or in vivo, and uh, working at the protein level can make uh, developing high throughput methods, uh, for example, for uh, molecule screening uh, and also virtual screening and modeling and to identify uh, active odorants at the molecular level. After, of course, you need some behavior, but you have already selected uh, active molecules. You know, molecules you know they are active and um, uh, at least detected by the insect. So in this context of reverse chemical ecology, uh, in my lab, we are targeting the odorant receptors. So what are those odorant receptors? If you look at an insect antennae, the antennae is the main nose of the insect. You can see that it's covered by um, a lot of hairs we call sensilla. And those sensilla detailed here are morphofunctional units that house the olfactory sensory neurons in red here. And those are classical neurons with uh, dendrites going uh, toward the outside and the axon going to the brain. At the dendr dendritic membrane of these neurons, represented here, you have those uh, odorant receptors. So when modulant molecules are uh, in the air are coming, they enter the uh, sensilla through pores. They are catched by, by binding, binding uh, proteins that transport them to the receptor. And then you have interaction with the receptor. Upon interaction with the receptor, you have a modification of the shape and opening of ion, an ion channel. So the electrical, the chemical signal is transformed into an, ele an electrical signal that will be transmitted to the brain. So um, in fact, those receptors, they are really at the core of odorant detection because they are the interface between uh, the outside the cell and the inside the cell. We think they are a very interesting target for pest control because of three reasons. The first one is that they are very divergent for, from vertebrate odorant receptors. In fact, insect and we do not smell the same way. The receptor uh, insect um, developed are uh, totally new and totally different from what has been known before on olfaction. In fact, they are seven transmembrane domain receptors. You can see here, and they work with uh, a co-receptor, obligatory co-receptor, and together they, uh, they make the ion channel. They are also very divergent in sequence from uh, vertebrate odorant receptors. In vertebrate, odorant receptors are classical GPCR, G protein coupled receptors. They are located uh, this way in the membrane. And when you have uh, odor entering, odor interaction, then you have activation of a G protein and a secondary uh, cascade leading to the opening of ion channels that are not the odorant receptors. So in insect, we have a ionotropic pathway and in vertebrate, we have a metabotropic pathway. This is very, very, very different functioning. And the sequence also, as I said, are very, diver very divergent because the insect or the insect really invented a new way of detecting odors. Uh, we don't really know yet the origin of those ORs, but it's not related to vertebrate odorant receptors. This means that if you want, if you target a receptor in insect, you won't uh, interfere with the vertebrate olfaction, which is the first important point. The second important point is that uh, odorant receptors are also very divergent between insect species. Here you can see a phylogeny of proteins, of odorant receptor proteins from a different insect order. And what you can immediately see is that there is no overlap of the colors. It means that the receptor from Imenoptera here in red are different from those of Lepidoptera that you can see in blue and also different from those of Coleoptera. What this means, it means that if you, uh, you can target a specific group of insects without interfering with other groups. For example, I'm thinking of beneficial insects. The third reason 
Sorry, I yeah, switched this one. The third reason uh, why we think or are um, interesting target is because of their structure. I said they are unrelated to vertebrate odolent receptors. They are unrelated to G protein coupled receptors, but they have a structure that reminds of a GPCR. You can see there are seven transmembrane domains embedded in the membrane. And this, this shape, this structure uh, in the pharmacology, uh, there is a very important know-how to design drugs uh, like agonists, antagonists, or blockers uh, that have been developed for GPCR. And we can use the same method to try to identify um, to identify uh, agonist uh, disturber for insect odorant receptors. And so we did not invent the reverse chemical ecology targeting odorant receptors because this has been first developed in mosquito and um, it appeared to be efficient. So um, our objective is to try to develop similar approach on, uh, on, on pest. And so uh, we have been working on the proof of concept uh, of the reverse chemical ecology approach using as the model the cotton leaf worm Spodoptera littoralis. It's a noctuid of Lepidoptera. We chose, we chose this model because it's now a model species in molecular chemical ecology. We know a lot. We have sequenced the genome. We have done a lot of transcriptomes. Also, this is a representative of herbivorous and poly polyphagus Lepidoptera. And um, uh, another important point is that it's a Spodoptera species and uh, the Spodoptera gender uh, group major pest worldwide. Uh, for example, on this map, you can see the relative to our species. You have the fall army worms, Spodoptera frugiperda. For sure, you've heard of this, that came from America and spread in Africa some years ago. And now it uh, invaded all Asia and is also found in Australia. It's um, also a sister species of Spodoptera litura that is mainly located in Asia, but it's going more and more west, threatening Europe. And uh, Spodoptera litoralis itself is usually found in East Asia and uh, in Africa, but more and more we can see expansion to the north. And now we found a species every year in South France. So as I said, using different omics approach, we have now a full repertoire of the odorant receptors in this species. We have identified 73 of them. And we started a pioneer large scale functional study of these odorant receptors. So to, to know the function of a receptor, meaning what odor they can detect, we use a very interesting system that is called the Drosophila empty neuron. This has been developed in the Carson's lab in Yale University in the USA. And the principle is that you have a Drosophila line that is a mutant. And in, in, in this uh, line, there is one neuron devoted of its own odorant receptors. So this line might be generated in Carson, Carson lab and we could get the line. So this neuron, in fact, does not respond to anything because there is no receptor. And using transgenesis, it's possible to uh, target the expression of any exogenous receptor in this specific neuron. So that's, that's what we did for uh, one third of the different odorant receptors identified in Spodoptera. Once you have the lines generated, you put electrodes so this is electrophysiology. You put electrodes targeting this neuron and you register the response upon stimulation with a large array of different compounds. Um, this, done at the, this is done at the neuron level. So the response we register is like that. It means that we register action potential. And what me we measure is the frequency of the action potential because this is a stimulation. When you have response to one uh, odorant, you have um, uh, an increase in the frequency of the action potential that can be measured as a number. This development has been done in the frame of uh, uh, one of our former PhD students, Arthur de Fouché, in a great collaboration with Nicolas Montagnier that developed in our lab all the uh, Drosophila genetics. And we also worked in collaboration with the, agricultural, the University of Agriculture in Sweden, SLU, um, uh, because we shared the receptors because it was a lot of work. 
So to make a long story short, here are all the results of this large screening. This is a heat map of the receptor response. On the, on the right here, you have the receptors, and up here, you have the different odorants that we used to test the activity on the receptor. And the more the color is red, the more the frequency increase, and the more it's blue, uh, the, the less, <laughs> the, the less uh, it responded. So from this map, we can uh, already see two interesting things. Is that, for example, this receptor can respond to um, different, to more than one odorant. So one OR, OR for odorant receptors, can respond to several odorants. And on the other way, one odorant, for example, this one, can be detected by more than one receptors. So this is really the principle of olfactory coding, meaning that with 70, uh, around 70 odorant receptors, the spodoptera is able, in fact, to smell thousands of different odors because of this combinatorial pathway. But uh, we have, as I said, we have only worked on one third of the odorant receptors, and our screening panel is not very large compared to what can, uh, what is around um, in the chemical landscape of Spodoptera. So we are still far to understand the sensory basis of an herbivore ecology. I said we have a limited number of odorant tested. We have a limited number of ORs. So we still have a lot of ORs that are orphan, meaning we don't know uh, which odorants they can detect. And also for the one that the receptor for which we have ligands, it's also possible that they recognize other ligands we don't know. So that's why um, we developed uh, in silico approaches to acceler accelerate this process, so even more than doing experiments. And we develop a ligand-based in silico approach to identify new ligands. And we have focus for this proof of concept on two receptors, OR24 and OR25 that are highlighted here. We developed this in um, deep collaboration with the Institut de Chimie de Nice in South France, because they are chemists and modelers. And this project has been done in the frame of two PhD, uh, the PhD of Gabriela Caballero Vidal in our lab doing the electrophysiology, and Cédric Bouisset in his lab doing all the models. So the principle is to combine chemoinformatics and machine learning with experimentation for the identification of new ligands. So in brief, we use 24 and 25, or 24 and 25, because we already know some ligands for these receptors. And the principle is that we uh, look at all the common molecular descriptors shared by the ligands of these receptors. With the common descriptor, we constructed a model, a quantitative structure analysis, a quantitative structure activity relationship model. It means that uh, the model will create um, a matrix in which all the molecular descriptors that are present in the known ligand should be found through virtual screening of uh, virtual libraries. So uh, with this model, you can screen uh, PubChem, for instance, a database of millions of volatiles. So we did that first. We get a lot of uh, results and sometimes um, some heat that are toxic. So we decided to work in a more um, uh, realistic library for herbivore using a library of flowers and plant volatiles. So we screen this uh, library with our model we get some uh, heat, some potential agonist to the receptor that has been tested by Gabriela uh, on the receptor itself using electrophysiology, the same technique, the empty neuron technique I explained you uh, just before. And when the predicted ligand appeared to be active on the receptor, then you had a new ligand to the loop and the new ligand can feed again the model in a virtual loop and then you, you, you've been more and more precise on the prediction and, and more and more uh, accurate. So to present you the results of uh, this study, we, through the QSAR analysis, we predicted uh, 28 ligands for OR24 OR and 33 for OR25. And Gabriela tested all those uh, predicted ligands on uh, the receptor itself expressed in the drosophila antineuron. 
So here are the results for OR25. So those represent the um, activity in action potential per, per second. So the frequency of the neuron activity upon stimulation with a different odorants. Those are controls for, of course, the solvent and nothing. And this is also a positive control. This is a molecule that we know, uh, we know uh, activates this specific receptor. And all the other are the, are the predicted uh, ligands. So what you can see uh, from this result is that in fact, 22 of the compounds were indeed active on the receptors. It's where you have the, the significant sign uh, with stars here. So many of them were indeed active with a success, success rate of 67% of predicted active molecule on the receptor. So it was quite interesting. And, and quite good results. And even more interesting, we found some ligands that are more active than the most active ligand we identify through experimental screen. Let's see the results for OR24. It's even more impressive because again, the controls here, and you can see that out of the 28 predictive ligands, in fact, 26, 26 were active, which is a success rate of uh, more than 80%. So you can see that uh, with this virtual screening, we can uh, have a, a good selection of candidate uh, molecules that can be active on the, on the insect. But here we only, here with this electrophysiolog electrophysiological assay, we can only say that the receptor can respond the receptor can detect those molecules, but we don't know about the effect on the insects. As I said, the end at the end of the reverse chemical ecology approach, you still have to do some, some behavior, but you have uh, a pre-selected molecules. So this is what Gabriella did at the end of her PhD. She tested the um, different predicted ligand on the behavior of larvae using a classical white tube assay. You put the insect here, you have two airflow coming uh, in each arm of the white tube. On one side, you put solvent. On the other side, you put the odorant you want to test. And then you measure the percentage of choice. Uh, so the, the, the insect is going to, to walk this way and then make a choice, either go here or either go there. And these are the results. So of course, we did nothing and nothing on two sides and there is no choice. We used a negative control. We know that the species doesn't like, uh, doesn't care about osimen, and in fact, we do not have any choice. And then we tested the different components, and you can see that uh, all the components tested in this assay were indeed attractive to the insect. <clears throat> so, what we have seen now is um, a ligand-based approach. It means that you, you need to know some information on the receptors because what the, the first step is to collect the already known ligands to construct the QSAR model. We need some ligands and we need the molecular descriptor. For ORs for which we do not have any information, we are using a different approach, which is OR-based uh, approach, especially uh, OR structure guided approach. This is a, a new um, project we are developing, so I'm not going to show you results, but it's now possible because there have been some uh, odont receptor structure published recently, and uh, it has been very difficult to get um, to get structure of odont receptor because they are flexible in the membrane, so you cannot do crystallization, classic crystals, uh, to determine the structure. So those structure have been established by uh, cryoelectromicroscopy. And uh, this really revolutioned uh, the, um, the field of, uh, of molecular chemical ecology. Not only this, but also we have now new modeling tools. For example, maybe you've heard of AlphaFold that is based on artificial intelligence and that can predict the three-dimensional structure of a given protein. So this project is developed in our lab by Camille Mélin, my colleague, and uh, it's possible to determine the structure of a given receptor to determine the binding pocket. And it's also possible to do virtual docking 
uh, meaning that you try to put in the pocket different molecules, all this in silico, again, to have some prediction that will be tested uh, experimentally. This is, in fact, like a drug design approach. So this is what we are now developing, and this is particularly, particularly efficient for de novo ligand identification for orphan receptors. So to conclude uh, on this project, um, you've seen that, I, I hope you are convinced that reverse chemical ecology is, is a good approach to identify new uh, agonists for don't receptors and a new behaviorally active odorants. Uh, two approaches uh, are used, the ligand guided approaches with interesting results I show you, and now working, working hard on the OR structure guided approach that is really promising. So with all this information, we have a better knowledge on the insect odorscape, meaning what the insects are really able to, to smell. And uh, also it accelerates the discovery of new semiochemicals that can be used uh, for pest control. We have talked today only about odorant receptors, but what about gustatomics? Because in, in fact, if the insect decided to eat the plants, it's not only because it smells it at distance, but also because it tests it and he likes it. This is really interesting because insects, they also have gustatory receptors to test those plants. And uh, we have identified that in some species, especially polyphagus, species, polyphagus lepidoptera, there is a huge expansion of gustatory receptors. There are a lot of duplication in the genome. You can see here some scaffold and all the small orange uh, arrows represent gustatory receptors. And for this, I would like to thank Fotini because that, she worked with us at that time to annotate all those ORs and it was a real nightmare. And finally, uh, she could complete the work and you can see on this phylogeny, all the red ones are only found in polyphagous species. So this to say you that we have a plethora of additional targets. ORs, they represent good targets, but I'm sure in the future, gustatory receptors can be used as well for the reverse chemical ecology approach. So uh, I would like to acknowledge, of course, uh, all the people that participated in this work. Um, my colleague, uh, Camille, for the modeling, uh, Nicola for gen uh, drosophila genetics and electrophysiology, Christelle for help in electrophysiology, and Marie Christine for all the molecular biology. And the different student and postdoc we had with us, of course, Fotini, <laughs> but also Arthur that did all the screening of the ORs, and Gabriela, Gabriela that worked on the virtual, um, on the experimental validation of virtual screening, and Arthur Conte is a new PhD student now devoted to the uh, OR-guided approaches. As I said, we've been working with SLU in Sweden for this work and with uh, Institut de Chimie de Nice, especially uh, Sébastien Fiorici, that is uh, the um, supervisor of Cedrix. And we are also working in collaboration with China. We have a, a big collab with a group at the Institute of Plant Protection in Beijing. And I also thank all the founders of uh, this research, different INR project, National Research Agency, project from CNRS, uh, funding also from China, and a new uh, EU project that is starting, uh, specifically focusing on integrated pest management. And I thank you all for your attention, and I will be very happy to discuss with you and take questions.